Well, good morning. Um, my name is Matthew Renshaw and I am Stantex Group Leader for our New South Wales water business. I'm dialing in today from Garrigal country and from the Aboriginal place name of Eleonora, meaning camp by the sea. I'd like to give you a very warm welcome to Stantex live webinar on the workplace exposure standards for airborne contaminants and compliance. Uh, just sharing the agenda on screen now uh, for today. So Safe Work Australia's review of the workplace exposure standards for airborne contaminants has resulted in imminent changes required by industry. And these changes, especially those proposed to hydrogen sulphide exposure limits, significantly impact the urban water industry. We very much hope you enjoy the presentation today and are able to take away some of the insights shared by our We Care for Air specialists in this field. Just the, the agenda on screen there for you. Um, I'd like to now start off with an acknowledgement of country. We can just move to the next slide. Thanks, Ian. So we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, waters and communities where we work. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. I just wanted to take a brief moment to note this magnificent painting uh, by contemporary Indigenous artist Shirnay Sutton from the Kalkadoon people from the Mount Isa area in Queensland. The piece was commissioned recently by Stantec as part of our Reflect Reconciliation Action Plan. Uh, and this painting represents Shone's interpretation of Stantec Australia and our reconciliation journey. We're always looking for ways to build stronger connections with communities, and that includes the way we work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Meaningful engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and businesses and a commitment to the prosperity of their communities is essential to our promise to design with community in mind. Um, I'd now like uh, Dr Ian Evanson to share a safety moment of direct relevance to today's session before I provide some brief introductions on today's speakers. Hey everybody, um, good morning, thanks for joining. So um, at the start of all uh, Stantec presentations we always do a safety moment. Um, in life today's uh, discussions I thought uh, we'd do one specifically about hydrogen sulfide. So, um, hydrogen sulfide gas um, is particularly nasty gas. Uh, we're all fairly used to it in the wastewater industry, which can sometimes form a little bit of complacence. But um, it was used as a chemical weapon back in World War One, twice by the British in, in, in 1916, to give you an idea of its toxicity. Um, the World Health Organization has listed um, some concentrations from research, basically, which give you an idea of its effects. Um, I want you to take particularly note at the higher end for the moment, for the 100, 400 and 500 values for olfactory paralysis, where you can't smell it anymore, respiratory distress and death. Um, and then have a look at this, um, this graph. This was a trace we recently took at a um, pump station that we were investigating for odour complaints. Um, as you can see from the blue line at the bottom there, that, which is the concentration of H2S, uh, most of the time it's, it's pretty much less than five, less than two, um, and so it really doesn't cause an issue. Um, however, you, if you look um, at the point uh, here, it shoots up from five to over 350 parts per million, which effectively is right in the range where it will give you pulmonary edema and you can't smell it anymore. So you wouldn't get any real warning of that happening. Um, the people that were on site, um, thankfully, didn't have the um, hatches open at this point. This was taken uh, from the logger afterwards. But um, they were complaining about uh, high concentrations of, of VOCs, uh, which is the orange line. Um, this is an industrial catchment, but still the concentrations are very high, so so they could have toxic effects as well. We don't know what they were at the time. So um, the takeaway from this is that although you think the area might be safe and that hydrogen sulfide um, background levels can be very low, they can get very dangerous very quickly without any warning. And um, 
as you can see from the secondary trace here with VOCs, that hydrogen, it, sewage just isn't about hydrogen and sulfide, it's also other gases as well that can cause harm. That's our safety moment. Thanks, Ian. Uh, just some brief introductions to today's speakers, everyone. Um, got Dr. Ian Evanson, who you've just met on screen. Ian's Principal Process Engineer and Practice Leader for Odor and Corrosion Management in our business. Dr. Ari Shame uh, joins us as well. Ari is a Principal Process Engineer in our Water Group in New South Wales. And he specialises in odour control from wastewater systems with a heavy focus on dealing with particular contaminants in which he completed his PhD. And we have Jeff Mann. Jeff's a principal air pollution and odour control specialist with over 40 years of experience in dust, gas, vapour and odour air pollution control. Um, and off the top, I'm, I'm honestly honoured to have and lucky enough to have these three gentlemen working with Stantec and as part of our team. And I'd like to thank them for their efforts in keeping abreast of today's subject matter and promoting the interest of our water industry colleagues and organisations. Just a reminder, we are live today and the webinar is being recorded. The chat box is open to all uh, to make comments or post questions. Um, we'll reserve those questions until the end. Hopefully we'll have some, some good time to, to have a, a bit of a discussion on, on in answering some of your comments or questions. And we'll be sending out a link to the recording if you do miss anything. Um, so um, let's, let's get into it. And uh, I'd like to hand back to Ian for some background on today's session. Hello again, everybody. Um, that's a nice, beautiful picture of me at a, um, a wastewater treatment plant recently um, above an inlet works, which um, wasn't very well um, contained. And it was actually giving off quite some significant levels of H2S gas, so we uh, required respiratory protection. So a bit of a background. I mean, obviously today we're going to be focusing on the wastewater industry, but the WES review covers everything um, from silica dust and coal dust uh, to, to um, close off the recent uh, issues around silicosis, all the way through to all of the um, the existing um, exposure standards of all compounds which are considered to be hazardous to health. Um, so, although today's focus is on um, H2S, we will be touching on a few other compounds, and the stuff that we'll be talking about goes across pretty much all of them. So. Back in 2018, um, Safe Work Australia instigated the WES review. Um, the reason they did this is because it was known that the WES list was significantly out of date for a number of compounds, um, and that the methodology which they were used for updating the WES list was a bit ad hoc, wasn't fit for purpose, it took too long to update the WES list, it was too hard, people questioned the data to change um, contaminant concentrations on the WES list. And um, so they decided to wipe slate clean and go out to industry and say, OK, we're going to have three options. Option one is we'll just leave it as it is. Option two, we're going to change the methodology um, to a streamlined methodology for updating the list of compounds. And option three was to make it sort of advisory and not real limits. Um, they went out to industry, um, got some got uh, preferences. It was pretty strong for option two. Option three, they um, people thought, well, if they're just advisory, people aren't going to do it. And uh, option one, everybody was like, well, it doesn't work. So what's the point in keeping it? So effectively, they knocked out option one and option three, and they kept option two. They also decided to change the workplace exposure standards to workplace exposure limits to really underline that it's a limit. Um, and they decided with the ministers that a three year implementation period um, would be sufficient. We'll touch on that later. Um, obviously, there are some issues with that. So here's the framework um, which they um, had and what they proposed. The top one here is, is the one that they had. It took over 12 to 18 months to add or subtract things from the West list, and it wasn't really implemented. So they came back with a streamlined methodology to effectively add stuff to the list um, within th uh, three and a half, four months. Um, that was um, adopted. It was. Um, it also set out not only the methodology, but it set out 
um, what information sources that we're going to take the toxicology information from to update the list. It was all peer reviewed by Health Canada, also Australian um, toxicologists um, uh, and in an international toxicologist, um, not ourselves. Um, and they um, took that to the ministers and back in November 2019, um, they agreed to it. So once the methodology was agreed to, they split the, the existing list into uh, 15 sets of chemicals and sent them out for public comment. Um, got rather inter interrupted as everything did with COVID. Um, and so it was a bit stop starty, but they um, eventually um, issued the final um, set, 15, um, uh, which closed back in uh, August. Um, then took all of the, the feedback um, and uh, made the decision internally what limits they were going to um, have across the board. So not just hydrogen sulfide, but every single limit that they were proposing to change. And to give you an idea of of how many they changed, it was like 60 to 70 percent of of the chemicals were reduced significantly, some by orders of magnitude. So it 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 was noted that there were there it was considerably out of date. Um, New Zealand did something similar back in um, in 2019, um, and they actually instigated for hydrogen and sulfide an interim um, tie waste average an STEL of 5 and 10, reducing it from 10 and 15 in November 2020, because they decided it was so out of date that they would have to change it straight away. They proposed to drop to 1 and 5, which as we'll see are the proposed limits for hydrogen sulfide um, in 2022. Um, and so they're a bit ahead of us in New Zealand. And uh, to give you an idea, the rest of the world, um, the UK is currently at 5 and 10, Canada is at 1 and 5. Again, these are all um, just for hydrogen sulfide, um, eight hour TWA and STL values. So all caught up, what's next? Well, in December, Safe Work Australia recommends uh, to the ministers all of these values. The ministers then have a bit of a thinky process and they agree to them. They've already been given the heads up and some of them have already stated that they will accept the WES list in full. So uh, just to give you an idea that, that that most of them are on board, or in the case of New South Wales, the previous uh, minister was on board. We've had a few changes recently. Um, once they've agreed to them, basically we implement them in each jurisdiction. So safe work, SA, uh, NT safe work, um, workplace health and safety, Queensland, New South Wales, um, work safe, uh, basically adopt them. Um, and then they become enshrined in law effectively. Um, the ministers have already agreed to a three year time frame. Um, Safe Work Australia has stated openly that that is not up for discussion and it's not up for grabs because the ministers have already agreed to it. Um, however, um, they have mentioned um, that given there are some issues with complying within three years for some industries, the ministers would be open to discussions directly. But that aside, effectively, we're looking at the new limits being required um, early to mid 2025 across all industries, and there are a lot of changes. So lots of specifics and the implications of this. And it's another site up in North Queensland for those people in far north Queensland that have joined us, they might recognize it. Um, uh, uh, picture that I posted on Facebook of my uh, uh, wonderful uh, safety gear. It was 38 degrees and um, about 98% relative humidity. And you can take it from me that wearing full face VA is not pleasant under those conditions. So just a bit of a reminder when we talk about some of these values um, coming up pretty soon. Oh, sorry. So a few definitions to start off with um, because there's a few misconceptions on these. Um, the time weighted average of eight hour TWA is generally based on an eight hour shift. We can change that to longer shifts and shorter shifts um, uh, by uh, implying an equation, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, but when we're talking about the time weighted average TWA values, we generally, um, it's generally on eight hours. One thing to note is that TWA limits 
do reduce if you have mixtures of gases. And that's something which has a significant effect um, now that some of the values have been dropped to, to or proposed to be dropped to such low levels. The short term exposure limit, STEL, it's a 15 minute rolling average. You can't exceed it um, at any time during an eight hour working day, even if you're exposed if that day is less than TWA. So it's the two separate limits, which, both of which have got to be adhered to. The STEL can't, can't be longer than 15 minutes and you can't have more than four exposures per day. So effectively, if your rolling 15 minute average goes over 15 minutes, uh, it goes over the STEL, sorry, um, and that happens four times, you're done. You have to leave the area, you can't continue to work. Um, and there's got to be 60 minutes successive exposure to the STL. Those definitions come directly from um, Safe Work Australia and the pretty standard. Um, <laughs> thanks, Cameron. Um, the new one, which has taken, which uh, hasn't really been noticed that much, is the IDLH value or immediately dangerous to life or health. Um, these values have been adopted straight from NIOSH. Um, they haven't been questioned. The reason being is because at higher concentrations, the science is very obvious. Um, hydrogen sulfide gas worldwide takes approximately 10 lives per year on average across um, the Western world. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite a nasty gas. Um, it's considered to be a knockdown gas. It affects um, both your lungs, but it also affects your central nervous system. Uh, high concentrations, we're talking hundreds of ppm. Effectively, it affects your uh, your brainstem and shuts down your uh, breathing reflex. So you effectively just collapse and die there and then on the spot. Those concentrations, the ones up at uh, several hundred ppm to a thousand ppm. The IDLH new standard, I suppose, or new definition which uh, WorkSafe has adopted is to address those. Um, it is a concentration above which you can only uh, use highly reliable breathing apparatus, which is effectively full SCBA gear. And I picture myself there doing training, walking around um, uh, the local uh, village with wearing SCBA gear. It's for those that haven't worn it, it's heavy and it's difficult and it's certainly not stuff you want to be working in. Um, and you, effectively, you've got to take precautions to ensure that workers immediately leave and get to the IDLH value. So that might just be fair enough, but given the values which they've adopted, this has very significant impl implications, more so than the TWA or the STL values in my mind to certain um, places. So we've spoken about these changes. So what are they? Well, hydrogen sulfides up at the top there. Um, I've picked other ones as a snapshot that affect the wastewater industry. Um, but as I said, it's the entire West list with several hundred compounds, 60% of which have uh, uh, 60, 70 percent of which have changed. So this is just a snapshot for the wastewater industry. Um, and take note as well that given ice um, manufacture locally in in uh, by uh, local chemists in, in the in the in the drug trade, there are a lot of VOCs in our wastewater system which have a significant impact, and those are also on the West list as well, which are highly toxic. So these ones are just associated with proteins and breakdown and, and sulfate respiration though. Um, hydrogen sulfide, uh, the current STL is 15 parts per million and the 8 TWA is 10. Now they're proposing to drop those to five and one. So it's dropped by a factor of three for the STL and a factor of 10 or a magnitude for the ARTWA. So we're talking massive drops here. And then they've also come in with this IDLH of 100 ppm. Now remember the IDLH is the absolute maximum um, that uh, you, you should be ex uh, exposed to at any time. You have to leave the area immediately and you have to, if you have a risk of exposure to that, then you've got to wear SCBA equipment effectively. 
It doesn't spell it out, but it says the maximum possible respiratory protection. So this 100 parts per million, uh, quite a few people on, the, on this call will think, well, hang on, I've got tons of places which are over that. And yeah, it's entirely true. We get over 100 ppm a lot of times. So um, that's H2S. Dimethyl sulfide um, comes from the breakdown of proteins. Um, it has a new ALTWA of 10 parts per million that wasn't on the West list. Ammonia, the STELs and uh, TWAs are, are reducing from um, uh, uh, the ST, uh, sorry, the ALTWAs are reducing. They've also put in a new um, IDLH value. And methyl and ethyl the captain haven't changed. They were already there at 0.5 parts per million. Um, we didn't really bother too much about methyl and ethyl mercaptan, um, because uh, and their effects because they are there, but they're at fa fairly low concentrations. Um, but because the recommended uh, H2S TWA is being reduced so much, and dimethyl sulfide is now included, um, these combined gases in the wastewater industry can can make people can really unstuck very quickly. So additive effects, um, we've always had to take account of different compounds and mixtures of gases. It's, we don't really find many places where we're just exposed to a gas. So um, the exception of that is uh, the chemical process industries where you might be exposed to dimethyl sulfide or dimethyl disulfide in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, but for wastewater and other industries, it's generally a mixture of gases. Now, if that mixture of gases, they're all on the WES list, then we all have to um, take into account that list of compounds. You can't just go, well, H2S currently is um, an ARTW of 10, so I can go up to 10 on H2S, and, and the captain is up to 0.5, so I can go up to 0.5 on the captain at the same time. You have to take into account that additive effect. So what does that mean? Well, Again, just from the wastewater industry, here's a sulfur cycle for those that haven't seen it. Generally, we're thinking about this part of the sulfur cycle um, where we're taking sulfate and we're going through anaerobic respiration to form hydrogen sulfide gas. Happens in sewers all the time. Um, the more anaerobic um, the sewer, the quicker it happens. And you, um, uh, for some sites with a lot of sulfates due to um, uh, uh, sulfate uh, increases in the wastewater, which can come from salt water intrusion or acid sulfate soils. These H2S values can get to a thousand ppm in the gas phase at the treatment plants. Far north Queensland happens all the time. So again, that's right in the knockdown gas zone, which will kill you instantly. But there's also this part of the equation here where you have um, a protein released from cells, which undergoes degradation to form methyl mercaptan. Um, dimethyl sulfide and dimethyl disulfide, and then ultimately H2S again. This happens in biosolids a lot, but it also happens in wastewater systems that have a lot of protein from restaurants, what have you. So the captains um, take a bit of a snapshot. We've got a fairly big database across the country. Look at the average values here in WA, um, which is quite hot in septic systems. We've got an average of 0.9 ppm. South Queensland, a bit cooler, um, 0.2. Far North Queensland, a lot hotter, a lot more septic, uh, 1.28 uh, as an average. New South Wales and Victoria, very similar to about 0.25. Now, remember the 8 hour TWA from the captains is uh, 0.5. So, Above normal sewage, you have H2S and you have mercaptans. And you have mercaptans at half of the H2, uh, half of the half of their TWA value. So in order to take that into account um, and give you a total exposure limit, effectively you'd have to get your AR TWA and for hydrogen sulfide and divide it by two because you've already got 50% uh, of your um, methyl, methyl mercaptan levels. So uh, currently your ARTWA isn't 10, it's 5 for a mixture of gases, but the future one isn't 1, it's 
So just be very aware of that. These are the additive effects. Um, in the past, to reduce things considerably, now with these proposed values, drop them to ridiculously low levels. And by say ridiculously low levels, I'm not saying it's ridiculous that they've dropped them this low. I'm saying that you're really talking at the limits of detection for a lot of the equipment which is being used. So um, just quickly so talking about the AR TWA, these are the uh, models to adjust for a longer um, exposure or a longer shift time. Ultimately, if you have a longer shift, your TWA drops. So from memory, I think um, if you go from an eight hour shift to a 10 hour shift, the um, the eight hour TWA phase stress drops from um, 10 down to about seven or eight from memory. I haven't done it for a while. So good segue from before really about um, measuring this. Now we're all, we're all aware of instruments, personal detectors that you can go slap onto your belt. When these um, new proposed limits came out, we approached a few suppliers and said, hey, do your detectors actually work at these levels? Bear in mind that we're not talking about one, we're potentially talking about 0.5. And they've actually come back and, and given us a, a, a list. I would say this is just a small sample of instruments, so I'm just giving examples and, that, and it's not an endorsement. But these uh, Ventus Pro and Ventus MX5s and MX6s and the Draghi units all the go down to a 0.1 ppm resolution and all would um, would be suitable for, for, for measuring your exposure of gases. However, you should note that they all are cross-sensitive to other compounds as well. They're electrochemical cells, so they are cross-sensitive to the captains, for example. And that might actually help you because if you have a detector which is giving you a H2S reading that's cross sensitive to the captains, then it almost gives you an ad hoc reading of the uh, of your total exposure. But that's something which varies from unit to unit. So, what does it all mean? I mean, it, it's all very easy talking about these reductions, and, and but I've just picked a few examples of basically the effects it has, um, and I've tried to to pick examples where. Previously, there wasn't really an issue, but under the, the, the new values, there will be a significant issue. Just to give you some um, some context, um, before we get into the examples, there are going to be lots of sites and lots of processes um, where the new values don't really have an impact at all because they're unmanned sites, or you're not there for you know eight hours, or you. Um, or all the processes are, 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 are close controlled or you have uh, liquid phase chemical dosing. I've just picked examples where it does have a significant impact to give you a taste. So example one is a treatment plant. Um, this um, specific example is from data collected from the site. I haven't put in the site's name or, or, or any identifiers for obvious reasons. Um, if people want to provide me with additional information afterwards, I can always do that, but I'd have to uh, request owner permission. So treatment plant, it's a building um, with screenings in it or a grit tank in it or a primary tank in it. There are lots of examples all the way down the East Coast and West Coast of, of buildings such as this. Um, People could go into the building. It wasn't very pleasant. It was humid, but they could go in there and they could do work and they could do work for a full day um, and not breach the H2S um, limit. That was when the TWA was at 10. If we take the same data and we run it through the, the new limits. It's really a roulette reel of how long you can stay in there. So um, on one particular date here, you see that we can, uh, if we consider the effect of the concentration of methyl by captain there, we exceed our eight hour TWA in, within four hours. So now somebody who's working there could only work half a shift. They can't work two, the full shift. So now you need two shifts in order to do the same amount of work as one worker did previously. Um, if we pick a different day um, in, in the week, even without in considering the captain, we basically blow through our eight hour TWA in less than an hour. H to us. So 
you can't do much in an hour if you're, if you're fixing a pump it's very difficult and then the, it on other days basically you it, it varied from five minutes to um, seven hours but it was pretty much um a real reduction of the ability to maintain the plant and on some days you were unable to maintain the plant in those rooms because you couldn't be in there for more than five minutes without reaching your eight hour TWA. So it increases the number of teams and it significantly increases the, the operation and maintenance required in those sorts of scenarios. You just wouldn't really put those open things in, in, in rooms anymore. So, all right, let's take it out of the room and stick it in a field. So here's an example of the balance tank. Um, the H2S, it's a quiescent surface. The H2S disperses to atmosphere, putting aside odor complaints and, and, and nuisance for a second. We're just looking at um, uh, the health and safety impacts of H2S specifically. Um, in the previous um, STL values for the week, we looked at the data, you'd only breach your STL once. So you could effectively, um, you, you'd breach STL, you'd walk away and then you, you could come back an additional three times as long as it was an hour later to finish off the work. But as soon as we drop the STL to five, we breach the that multiple times in a single day. So effectively, you would be permanently going and doing your work, leaving, doing your work, leaving. Remember, this is only um, 15 minutes. So taking a sample of the sludge blanket fixing a pump, fixing a motor, you just wouldn't be able to do it. So there's an STL risk there and that these STL and, and, and uh, IDLH numbers would really start then to affect the way in which you operate or potentially affect the way you operate and maintain your plant. Next example, example, far north Queensland, there's a trace of hydrogen sulfide gas underneath those covers. You can see pretty much uh, double peak per day, uh, reaching as high as 525 um, uh, parts per million under the covers. Great, you have a separation between yourself and the gas. That is right up until the point you need to do something with those screens, which means you have to take the cover off. Uh, I hate to say this, but most ventilation systems aren't designed to maintain containment when you to remove the covers. They just don't extract that much. The, um, that much air they're supposed to hold containment with the covers on so as soon as you open that cover to clean your screen you lose containment and that gas comes out now it's way above the IDLH that they're recommending so you'd have to and because you know that these are the sort of concentrations you're immediately talking about wearing SCBA equipment um, multiple people not working alone um, you're really talking about adding additional equipment such as caustic dosing to bring these levels down when you open up the um open up the uh, covers on screens so obviously that makes a two minute job now two hours because you have to turn the caustic dosing on you have to wait for a while then you have, then you can go and access the 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 equipment um in case the caustic dosing fails you're still going to have to scba equipment standby and so on and so on it gets very involved so cleaning and screens, manual rake screens, maintaining instruments and equipment, which involves lifting covers, opening hatches, all instantly becomes a real problem. Not that it wasn't a problem to start off with, but it's now a legislative problem because of the IDLH values. Um, here's our example before, uh, in a, from our uh, safety moment. Um, just looking at the contrast between this trace where it's very predictable that you're going to get very high concentrations of gases to this, which is it becomes very unpredictable. So this then causes issues throughout network operations in that because you can get this sort of thing happen when uh, rising mains kick on and feeding into gravity mains, so on and so forth. Um, does that mean that you always have the potential to exceed the ideal age? In which case, does that mean you always have to be carrying SCBA gear? It it there are lots of pretty unanswered questions, um, to be honest with you, in in the, the implications of the IDLH value. So 
here's a um, a another example from a network um, classic pumping station. This one's in North Queensland. Um, you can see basically they have a nice big vent pole here. The idea being is that there's no odor control systems, no mechanical ventilation. Um, basically, the air these are sealed covers, and when the levels rise and fall, the pressurization of this pushes air up the pole and vents it to atmosphere at 12 meters. All very well and good, apart from the fact that the covers generally aren't very well sealed. And you can see this if you walk onto site, and you see the padlock here, which was brass and it's gone jet black. That's uh, copper sulfide, which is a clear um, indication that you have H2S leaking out everywhere. Um, and if you look here with this odor logger, we went on site and you can see it's just basically, I lifted the edge of the cover a shimmy, pushed the odor logger into it um, just to see what the risk was. Um, and because the wet well was filling at the time and it was positively pressurized, air came hunting straight out of that, that cover at 136 parts per million. Double whammy, can't smell it, olfactory paralysis, so you don't know it's there unless you have a meter telling you it's there. And we're up at these concentrations where you start causing some serious health effects. So here's just another example of um, a standard pumping station design now causes um, a, a real problem in that because of the rise and fall in fluid levels causing pressurization, how can passive ventilation still be acceptable? Um, because as soon as you lift those covers, it's going to vent straight out. So does that mean that all pumping stations now will have to have mechanical ventilation? So these are sort sort of uh, questions that that need to be count uh, the sort sort of questions that all of these uh, IDLH and USTL values start raising. Um, another example is uh, large trunk sewers. Um, there are a number of large trunk sewers: uh, Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, um, uh, over in uh, over in New Zealand. Um, where they do need desilting, de they do need rehabilitation, assets don't last forever. Um, previously, the, people would just go in and they'd do four hour shifts. It wasn't pleasant, but effectively they'd go in and they'd check it all out. That's fine. But with the much lower H2S values, it might no longer become cost effective to rehabilitate a sewer while it's in use. So does that mean now we have to duplicate assets in order to allow for maintenance? Because you can't just turn a trunk sewer off. I mean, sewage has still got to go down there. But so you say, OK, well, in that case, we'll provide everybody with SCBA gear. But having used SCBA gear, I can tell you now that you wouldn't want to be wearing it for eight hours, that's for sure. So does that mean two hour shifts? If it's two hour shift, does it mean more shift patterns, increases costs, takes longer to do it? There's, there's, there's some significant problems there with 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 rehabilitate real a bit rehabilitating and maintaining those assets so th there's a few examples um of some of the issues i'm going to pass you over to ari now who's going to uh, talk a little bit more about um the impacts uh risk assessment and methodology sorry need a drink <laughs> thanks ian uh if you can go to the next slide please so in any type of change like this, uh, we really need to address it in a risk-based approach. Um, we've talked about some of the main issues which can occur. That's not going to happen in all of your locations where you're operating. When looking at a risk-based approach to how uh, these issues will be mitigated, we really need to look at a few different things. Uh, firstly, which area are you looking at? You're looking at your networks, your treatment plants, um, each different parts of your, uh, your asset base will have a different set of risks associated with it. What type of activity are you uh, are you doing? Some type of planned maintenance where you can uh, where you can plan in some controls. Any type of unplanned or emergency works. Um, how is your exposure uh, during normal operation or some abnormal abnormal operational uh, areas? Every project at the moment is in a different phase. Uh, the ability to address these changes. Uh, is greater for those which is uh, those projects which are still being planned. 
and as you go through the the design phase and the construction phase and then the operation and maintenance activities the ability to address them is less and less uh, so it's best to get in early so with any type of impact a risk-based approach is good uh, there are different types of risk methodologies which you can do um, from a, a complex ones to uh, simple ones uh, I'll talk a little bit about consequences and likelihoods and how they apply to to these changes. Next slide, Ian. In general, the consequences, uh, how we would approach consequences in this context is where a consequence is related to how high the exposure level would be. At pumping stations and inlet works, um, generally if you can measure uh, the H2S and other contaminant levels, that would be ideal. But uh, at the moment, if you are looking at your whole uh, whole asset base, you may not have time to measure everything. So the risk consequence would be related to how septic your sewerage is upstream and how much industrial wastewater is there. We talked a lot about H2S, um, but if you have a lot of industrial wastewater coming through, you could have high COD loads or low pHs, which could um, change H2S levels. You could also be exposed to various volatile organics, which are being discharged as well. So pumping stations and inlet works, the risks are really related to uh, to how much uh, septicity is occurring in your networks um, and the industrial components. For bioreactors on treatment plants, uh, the, the risk could be related to the level of treatment. Is your aeration system working well? Uh, are your SRTs nice and long? Um, if they're not, then you could be at a higher level of exposure risk. For digestion, what type of um, digestions occurring uh, in your biosolids processes. Is it aerobic digestion or anaerobic digestion? Anaerobic tends to have a higher risk. Do you have enough SRT to affect your volatile, sulfur, sol uh, volatile solid reductions? Um, what type of biosolids processing do you have? Generally with a centrifuge compared to a belt filter press, you have a higher amount of shear, which generally means that your dewatering processes are good, but in storage processes, you'll get more generation of airborne substances. Um, so your outloading activities would need more uh, emphasis in addressing risks. In your sewer networks, particularly at rising main discharges, uh, how turbulent is your discharge? Because that can definitely have an effect on what type of release you can see. In a risk assessment, the likelihood, uh, the way we interpret this would be a risk of exposure. What type of operator activities are occurring? How frequently is the area accessed? Um, how frequently do pumps shut down? How much do they need maintenance? Um, how often do you need to get inside of a wet well? Um, is the area already mitigated in some fashion through covers or ventilation or some other um, separation mitigation measures? Um, will the public be exposed? Uh, so are you not only just looking at your own people, but also the public exposure? Um, previously, um, having odor impacts is a and a definite issue. Um, however, a, work, a health and safety impact could be higher. Slide in. So in your risk mitigation methodologies, generally we would advise to investigate whether changes apply to you and to your activities. Some of the exposure limits won't have changed. Um, in which case your, your exposure hasn't changed much. Some of the activities that your organization does, um, even at the new levels, your workers won't be exposed um, or won't be, won't be exposed to levels higher than what the new WES levels are. So if you uh, are assessing your areas and find that uh, your workers won't be exposed to above the levels, then that's fine. You don't need to do anything. But if something needs to be done, what can you actually do about it? Uh, can you change the your activities in the area to remove the substances from the work uh, from the workplace? Um, so, can you uh, 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 separate out a particular area? Can you do a chemical dosing process? Can uh, it's often very difficult to substitute the actual uh, processes on site to reduce or, or eliminate. Uh, these exposures, particularly for existing sites. If these substances can't be removed, what type of engineering solution can, can be applied? Uh, um, for instance, you can have a cover and ventilation systems or chemical dosing systems, 
um, or things like that. Uh, if these uh, type of engineering controls can't be managed, then perhaps there's an administrative or a PPE type of response. Generally try to avoid these in a hierarchy of mitigation, but if it's the only option left, uh, particularly under a temporary basis, then it may be uh, best to invest in getting some SCBA gear. With um, extraction and um, discharge options, there's also a wider impact to look at for your site. Um, Ian, if you can go to the next slide, please. So in addressing some of these issues, if you're covering and ventilating and extracting, um, firstly, you can, you can cover some areas. Um, however, in just covering alone, you're opening yourselves up to um, concrete corrosion for concrete systems. So it's best to also ventilate and also look at and look at lining, which can increase the cost of these types of controls. But if you're ventilating and discharging, um, you may be taking uh, a, a situation where you don't have an EPA license which covers a type of this type of airborne emission discharge to a situation where you might need need one, or it might alter the effects from your existing EPA license conditions, or you might end up with odor complaints if you're taking some laden H2S and discharging it through a stack. So these types of areas, these knock-on effects from your mitigation measures from a safety point of view should also be investigated. Ian, next slide, please. Some of the risk mitigation processes uh, which could occur uh, for permanent installations, containment and ventilation uh, would be a good engineering control some gas treatment prior to discharge or dispersion and or dispersion should be looked at. Um, and when I say permanent here, it could be a permanent installation which is only um, turned on when you're accessing a particular site, or it could be a permanent installation which runs continuously. Could there be some inhibitions with chemical dosing, where there's a short-term um, caustic dose to increase the pH and reduce the H2S release? or a longer term um, iron salt dosing system, which uh, reduces H2S systems, which reduces H2S emissions continuously. Could you get into your structures and reduce turbulence um, through water blankets or, or vortex drop shafts or things like that? Um, some temporary controls might be isolating your source of foul air when access is required, um, running a floating bed uh, over the wastewater itself when you need to get into a wet, wet well. Uh, or some temporary ventilation systems, uh, perhaps also reducing emissions when required, like having a temporary chemical dosing system. And failing all of that, can you have exclusion sites um, uh, providing safe breathing apparatus or SCBA? What type of work practices um, can you uh, update so that people aren't exposed for as long a time? Um, those types of risk mitigation measures are, uh, are available to you. Ian, next slide. And back to you, Ian. Thank you, Ari. Um, so, um, where to from here? Uh, we've gone through a lot of this stuff very quickly. There's obviously quite a lot of examples that we could have gone into, but we wanted to give you a taste. Um, I've seen the questions coming through, and we'll, we'll really um, want to get. Uh, responses to those today. So just a bit of a summary of, of, of where we are from here. Well, the exposure limits are likely going to happen. Changes to them are going to happen. The WES list has been reviewed and in accepted internally, WorkSafe Australia. The ministers have already said they'll, some of them, they'll adopt it in full. Um, there are questions on the data which has been used across the board for some of the the, the changes to the WES list. I think that's a side issue at the moment and we just have to look at what the plan changes are. The plan changes are that the ministers are about to going to be presented with the list and they will probably going to sign it off, which means that the the They'll then be adopted by the various states and, and the three year clock, clock will start ticking. Um, uh, the required works, and this is something that uh, uh, Bob mentioned. In my mind, three years 
but given the infrastructure changes that let's assume that they get adopted up to one and five uh, with an IDLH of 100. There's no reason to suggest they won't be. So let's just assume they do. Three years to comply in the wastewater industry based on the funding models and the engineering challenges, it's just not enough. And you can't go through a, a project cycle and construction and commissioning within three years. It just wouldn't work. Um, so the timeframes that they're proposing extremely tight and it would work for an industry that um, had one compound that they were producing and they could just say oh well, we'll just use a different compound that that's fine but really when the wastewater industry when you, you have no control of what people put down sewers and you have vast infrastructure um, which is not designed to meet these levels it's quite a challenge I mean, we know based on these levels, then project costs and even the viability is going to change. Uh, one of the things that I, I've had a chat internally with a few uh, planning consultants is it might be worthwhile you go back and revisit if you knew about these changes or these changes were considered, would you still do the project? And a few of them, they've come back and said, no, we wouldn't. So this comes back to what Ari, Ari was saying earlier, is this is that point in the in the project cycle is the, the time to make a change because you can do it without too much of a cost impact, although there'll be quite a substantial program impact. We know it's going to change the selection of equipment and processes, and it's going to have really big impacts on the way we operate and maintain wastewater infrastructure assets. There is opportunity, however, at this point to start planning for that change. There might be some movement on the levels. There might be some movement on the on on the three years. That aside, we know they're going to change to to an extent, and we know there's going to be a, a time for compliance. So this is the opportunity to stop planning for those changes in the most cost effective and um, easiest way possible. Um, if if you if the ministers are going to be swayed from the three years, then ultimately it's going to come down to a discussion around this is the program of works that we need to do in order to comply, and this is the cost. And and, and so and then that involves doing you going back and looking at your assets and looking at the risk of compliance, because it's it otherwise three years will shoot past and you know it, it's one of those things that. By working now, we can understand the um, the risk, and then we can figure out how we're going to fix it. And that is something you can do internally quite quite quickly. Right. So um, that's pretty much it. We have a load of questions to get through. So uh, I yeah uh, <laughs> um, yeah over to you, uh, Matt. You're on mute. Hey, lot, lots of questions, 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 questions. Thanks, thanks to the presenters. That was really engaging, and thanks to everyone online for all of your um, all of your comments and questions. Um, I might I might actually throw to Jeff Jeff Mann if there's um, a particular question that you've seen in the chat there. Uh, given we've we've probably got about five minutes remaining, is there something that you'd like to, to particularly address um, that maybe we haven't yet answered? Um, excuse me. Um, there's a couple of things which have come up in the chat. One is about measurement um, and how do we assess um, cross risks. Uh, personal gas monitors are a warning device. They're not an accurate measurement device. They're there to raise alarms and keep people safe. So you can't use them to calculate your total risk to a person. Um, this may come down to a campaign of assessing what the individual components are as under recognized lab methods and then making some sort of calculation about how that what that means to your gas detector what it probably means is that people with the lower end of the gas detector functionality may need to upgrade those um, some other things have come up about um, planning and having uh, plans in place for when these changes come through um, and about where the risk lies, uh, and yes, that's what this, that's what this presentation is about. Um, 
that the plans need to be put in place now to determine what the risks are to the, the, the business and how to address those. Um, uh, someone was commenting about um, adoption time frames. Our understanding is that the ministers are uh, meeting uh, in December to adopt these. As someone said, most states have an automatic take up of these. Um, so whatever is agreed to is automatically taken up. Um, so uh, it really is in in the in the political sphere now, unless there's some significant pushback. We know of some industries who have uh, are coming relatively late to the piece and trying to make changes. For instance, mining. Um, if you had a copper mine, your exposure to copper dust at a copper mine has just dropped by 95%, or it's about to. So there is, um, it's not just wastewater, it's across a range of industries, and a number of industri those industries are having to come up with plans relatively quickly. Um, Rob Oris is, us, is saying, show me the money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, it will come down to that, it will, and, and time frame and money. Um, anybody with a large treatment plant is not going to um, get this done in three years, um, particularly given the planning processes. Excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um, but yes, it will cost, and it will. And Ari um, pointed to earlier, if we capture and remove the contaminants, so they're no longer a workplace exposure issue, they could then become a stack emission issue. So maybe you didn't have an EPA license before, and now you do. So those are the main ones I picked up on. Matt, if anybody right. else has got anything they want to bring up now, please do. Yeah, if, if you'd like to raise your hand, um, if you've got any questions that you might like to to provide, then um, go ahead, raise your hand in the chat and we can um, unmute you and you can speak, speak freely. No, there's some conversation in the chat about electrochemical sensors. Um, now, Rob Oris, he has a question. I, I, I've been through this a number of times. I think that um, it's not, it's a, it's a decision that's been made, and I'm, I agree with the decision, but the timeline of three years is just impossible to meet. You need the short term plans. We need a short term plan at Sydney Water. And we need an asset management plan. And that'll take three years itself. And I think and we can progressively do this over time, and it's more likely 10 to 15 years. Hey? Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate the comments. Anyone else like to raise their hand and ask a question or offer comment? Just going to touch um, while we wait for another question on what um, Bob said there. Yes, um, it's 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 effectively a program of works that is going to take a long time, cost a lot in billions, not millions. Um, and um, and it's yeah, I, I agree. It's more in my mind, it's more of a 15 year program of works rather than compliance within three. But I think the ministers would in order for you to swear them and get and get exemptions, you, you'd have to approach them with some meat around that program works and say, well, this is the cost, this is how long it's going to take to do it. And then there would obviously be some uh, discussion around compliance timeframes, I think. Thanks, Ian. And we've got a question from Dom Gibbs. Thanks, Matt. Nice to see everyone again. Um, quick question, hope, hopefully. Uh, I've heard it thrown around that there's the possibility, and you've kind of touched on it, that you know the timelines might be renegotiated or the, the limits themselves might be slightly lower when they're implemented than what they're proposing now. Uh, a big thing for me is that's not too important. If you if the limits are changing, you still need to adopt changes, at least for just water. We need to make the changes at those sites regardless whether they're a little bit lower or a lot lower. Do you think the actual strategy or the designs or the approaches would change all that much between five and ten compared to say one and five um because i guess in my situation my context we need to start the planning work um 
and those unknowns are a bit of a risk to planning now. Uh, but I wanted to get your thoughts on whether or not there is a tweak to the giving 10 years to change or making it five and 10 for an interim period or permanently. Um, yep. let, me, let, me, let me jump in here. You yep. may have, for, for outdoor treatment plant um, with, let's call it particularly smelly inlet work, um, previously covers weren't required. So all of a sudden covers are required or you need a ventilator underneath, therefore you need to um, have some sort of odor emission control system. Um, it also changes your work practices. Whether you have the, and, and let's say you're just meeting lim limits now, and even if, it, if they only halve rather than go down by 90%, all those things still apply. Because as soon as you cover the tank, then you've got corrosion, you've got exposure issues, you've got all the rest. So. Halving, in my mind, halving it or reducing it by 90% is still going to have the same implications for you. I think, um, just to add to that, um, I think if they do take up a value like 5 and 10, it would be like um, New Zealand in that it's kind of a soften the blow. Well, it'll be 5 and 10, but then we'll drop it again. I, In my mind, um, If there is a higher value, it will just be interim. And given the, the equipment that's needed in its lifespan, you'd be designing for a future value, not an interim value. So um, there was a sort of question of pop up or statement as well, which I just saw. Um, there was a question earlier about legal um, risk and there was a statement as well just recently around health and safety and working with employers. Um, so that is a bit of an elephant in the room for a number of reasons in that previously um, the use of personal detectors wasn't wide use. They were used for confined space entry. They were used for um, areas of the plant where they're known to be an issue. Now suddenly with this, everybody might have a personal detector and so a you've got to manage all of that data but then because somebody's wearing it all of the time that might show a greater exposure which then leads to discussions around you know legal risk it's 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 a big can of worms to be honest with you it's a most difficult one to answer um the other the other aspect of it is that if people wearing detectors and the levels dropping so far, and this doesn't go just for H2S, it goes for a number of compounds, some of which have been dropped by orders of magnitude. Do the workers that had then been exposed to the previous numbers have a case to say, well, you've dropped this from 0.1 to 0 0.00001, I've been exposed to 0.1 for the past 10 years, who's, what about my health? So there, there are a lot of legal issues around there which are outside my real level of understanding I would probably be better off argued by lawyers but um, there is there is a number of questions around that, that context yes all right well look yes, we it. might we might leave it there I think for today everyone um, I'd just like to extend a very big thank you to all of you for attending and your participation lots of comments and questions um, a very big thanks to our presenters uh, Ian Ari and Jeff for contributing in the in the Q&A uh, and of course for your time invested in pulling together the presentation. Um, remiss of me not to mention Phoebe who's in the background. Phoebe is also on the call and has been instrumental in pulling together today's webinar. Um, we'd love to hear more from you um, uh, after today. So um, if you've got any questions or queries, feel free to get in direct contact with Ian, Ari or Jeff um, or even myself. Very, very happy to hear from you. So thank you again all. Um, have a good rest of your days. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.